everyone. Welcome. It's Wednesday, first Wednesday of the month. So I always come on and do an hour-long conversation about some topic that comes from psychology, yoga, spirituality, neuroscience, the integration of all of these things that um, have a, I have a deep love for. And I have to tell all of you that are jumping on, I think this might be my favorite topic yet that I've talked about. I'm so excited to get in there today and talk about dreams. Uh, I have been keeping a dream journal since my 20s, but didn't really start to fully understand or truly work with my dreams until midlife crisis time, which was, you know, starting in my early 40s. I think I'm still sort of in the midst of it on the cusp of 50. I'm moving, I'm moving out of it, but if I'm all honest. Welcome everyone. So many beautiful names on here. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Julie. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Sue. Hi, Mom. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Yvette. Good to see all of you here. I wanted to let you all know too, before we go into a conversation about our dream lives, which I really believe to be the portal between what's going on in our external life and actually what is going on inside of us. Uh, before we get into that, I do want to tell all of you that at the end of our time together, if you have a dream that you really are curious about that you haven't been able to make sense of, and you want to put it in the chat box, if you want to do it um, in a way where no one knows who you are, you, I think you can put that in the chat. You can just host or you can just send it to the panelist, which would be me. And I certainly will keep your name anonymous. If you also put please keep anonymous, that helps me as well. Um, someone on this call actually already did send me a dream. And so we are going to talk about her dream, although I'm going to keep her anonymous as well. Um, dream is really, dreams are really personal. They, I mean, it's really a raw opening into the truth of who you are. Um, but if there is a dream and you'd like to work the dream with me, um, I would be happy to do that with you. So keep it in the back of your mind again. <laughs> You know, just know there's about 60 people on this call right now. And uh, when it gets put up on YouTube later, we usually have three or 400 people that watch it. So just, you know, I'm just putting a fair warning out there that if you do share dream material, it, you know, there'll be plenty of people that hear it. All right, let's dive in. Like I said, this is one of my favorite topics. And I'm kind of curious that I haven't done it yet. So here we are. We're going to talk about all things dreaming today. Um, I always put this slide in there just for people who are new because we continue to get new people that join us every month. Welcome if you're new to Wisdom Wednesdays. Uh, this is the work that I do and that I, I talk about, although I'm not necessarily bringing in yoga today, although there is a form of dream work in yoga. We call it Yoga Nidra although I'm not going into that today. Here's all the different ways you can um, sort of interact with some of my work. I do this first Wednesday of every month. And I counted, there's about 20, I've been doing this since 2022, Wisdom Wednesdays in various formats. So there are about 20 videos out there on YouTube um, of topics that I've done in the past. And in fact, ones that relate really well to our conversation today, I did one on meeting your shadow. Um, last month, we did work with inner child. This all really relates to dream life as well. Also, a year ago, I did uh, a couple on purification practices, which are really great things to work with in the spring. Um, so go check it out. There's lots of content and information that you can work with. Um, and just FYI, I will not be doing Wisdom Wednesday in June or July. So the next two months I'm taking off, I'm going to be traveling and doing some other projects. Um, most likely we'll be back in August. And if not August, if I decide I need one more month, I'll be back in September. Um, but my podcast will keep going. So you can catch me every week with my colleague, Kate Moreland on Tend Her Wild. And then I am lucky enough to do a couple retreats a year. So I'm headed off to Costa Rica here soon 
uh, Peru this fall. I know Peru is full, um, but there's a wait list if you're like, I really want to go. Um, and then Greece, the fall of 2025. So, you know, keep your keep your eyes open for more details if that's interesting to you. All right. So I have to start this conversation about dreams with a bow of deep gratitude to two particular women who've had a massive impact on me and my life, in particular, how I work with dreams. So Candida Maurer um, is a psychologist. She's um, been a mentor of mine since I was in my 20s. Um, I took my first dream class from her. She was a, uh, a adjunct professor in my department. And uh, she and I have forged a very beautiful friendship and relationship. And we still literally see each other every week. And we talk about a various sunder of things, usually around psychology and spirituality. But every week we say to each other, did you have any dreams? And so every week we talk about our dreams. We share our dreams. So we're going to, in this conversation later, talk about why that's so important. But um, I have learned so much and continue to learn so much from uh, Dr. Maurer and her impact on me. Second person I just also have deep bows to is Kathy Pagano. Um, I met Kathy Pagano via synchronicity. I was following a newsletter. She wrote in this newsletter. Her work was featured in it. Um, she was doing midlife coaching. I reached out to her. And I did five years, five, maybe six years of weekly dream work with Kathy. So this was one of the things that really helped me in this midlife awakening, I call instead of midlife crisis, um, is really working with dreams. So Kathy truly is a master of dreams. She studied at the Young Institute in Switzerland. She knows symbolism inside and out. And again, life changed because of that deep work. So um, I am standing on the shoulders of giants. And so anything I share today really has been filtered through these two brilliant women's work. So just want to start out with uh, such deep gratitude to both of them. Um, I'm going to talk a lot today about Carl Jung, uh, who is, uh, I talk about him in probably every Wisdom Wednesday. So most of you, if you have been tuning in, you've heard me talk about Carl Jung a uh, great psychologist, psychiatrist who really, uh, you know, turn of the 20th century is when he was doing a lot of his work, early 1920s. Um, brilliant thinker is really considered one of the fathers of modern day psychology. And he was a big dreamer. He talked a lot about dreams, believed so much in the symbolism of dreams. And he says it is an age old fact that God speaks through dreams and visions. So this is Jung's perspective on dreams. And I'm also going to give you the scientific perspective, of course, because I like to keep one foot in the world of science and one foot in the world of the esoterics. So we'll 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 try to focus on both sides. But I wanted to start with sort of this seminal thinker's perspective on what dreams really are. So you may or may not know this, but uh, dreams are uh, the source of many uh, inspirational pieces of artwork and even inner um, inventions. So Mary Shelley, her idea for Frankenstein came from a dream. Uh, Stephen King's book, Misery, which of course Kathy Bates was um, in it, uh, the top corner. If you remembered that movie from the 90s, Misery, that came from a dream. We got good old Paul McCartney there who awoke from the dream with the words and melody of yesterday in his head. So many brilliant inventions. Let's start at the bottom right hand corner. That is uh, the first sewing machine. The creator of it, his name was Elias Howe. And in 1845, he dreamed up this invention, which then of course totally changed uh, the course of uh, how we make clothing, fashion, all of that. Um, good old, let's go around the circle here, good old Einstein. He spent years working on his theory of relativity with no success until nothing less than a dream came to him where he was sledding down a mountainside almost at the speed of light 
which caused the stars to change their appearance around him. And this was sort of a key moment for him to begin to rethink and then clearly come up with the theory of relativity. That slide in the middle is uh, the element benzene for you chemists out there. This was the early 1800s and scientists were trying to figure out the molecular structure of benzene. And one of the researchers had a nightmare one night where he was surrounded by snakes that formed themselves into hexagons, which gave him the solution to figuring out how uh, to understand this element benzene. This all leads to the periodic table of elements which was also uh, forged in the person's mind, the person who founded it. And I don't have that person's name down. I'm really sorry about that. And then of course, uh, DNA, the double helix. This also came from the inventor, Dr. James Watson. He saw an image of a spiral staircase in his dream, which gave him the idea for the structure of DNA. So I find this really fascinating because so many scientists, and I'm going to talk about science of dreams, really poo-poo the idea that dreams are messages from God or dreams are messages from the great mystery beyond. And you look at these sort of brilliant thinkers and their brilliant ideas that really came through this very vivid dream life. So um, I think it's it's just truly amazing. Okay, I have a couple other examples. Of course, uh, Joseph in the Bible was a, a massive dreamer. Uh, he was dreaming a lot about future events. And of course, it got him in trouble with his brothers who did not like that he knew things through his dreams. And of course, they threw him in a pit. The story goes on. You all know it. Uh, good old Abe Lincoln. He was an avid dreamer. He believed deeply in his dreams. He even foretold someone that he believed he was going to be assassinated because he saw it in a dream. And of course, that was his fate. And then last but not least, the picture down below is Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was also um, a powerful dreamer. And for years before her escape, she had recurring dreams of her flight to freedom. Um, in her biography, it's written that she was flying over fields and towns and rivers and mountains, looking down upon them like a bird and reaching at last a great fence or sometimes a river over which she would try to fly. She always said it appeared like I wouldn't have the strength. And just as I was sinking down, there would be ladies all dressed in white over there and they would put out their arms and pull me across. And of course, with Harriet Tubman, uh, the legend goes that she had deep connection with the angels and that she received messages over and over. She helped something, I don't know the exact number, but hundreds and hundreds of slaves escape to their freedom. And um, it's well known that she had dreams and she would get premonitions and sort of intuitive feelings about which direction to go. And she uh, was never caught in her many years of helping slaves to their freedom. So let's go into the science. This is, uh, it's interesting, right? And uh, we won't stay here indefinitely because I'm actually much more curious about dreams as direct messages from the great beyond, but helpful for us to know, and this is sort of Psych 101. Many of you have taken Psych 101, so this is no new information to you. We cycle through five stages of sleep at night and all dreams happen in the REM stage, rapid eye movement stage. And um, we spend about 20 to 25% on average percent of our sleep in REM. So we do dream a lot and every, most people do dream every single night, approximately four to six dreams a night. And dreams can be very brief, depending on how long you're in that REM stage. It can be up to a half an hour long. Um, so we do get a fair amount of dream time every single night. Now, there are things that can affect, especially REM. Um, science tells us that um, SSRI, so many antidepressant medications, as well as alcohol will suppress REM early in the night. So it means that there's not really any dreaming in the early parts of the night, but 
Rem then does rebound and shows up more intensely in the second half of the night. So um, if, if that, this applies to you, you might understand why. Now, cannabis, so if you are, you know, smoking marijuana before you go to bed as a sleep aid, which many people do, um, it looks like cannabis suppresses REM altogether. So um, again, if you're not remembering your dreams and you're um, smoking, that may be one of the reasons. Now, we do know that if people are sleep deprived, so they're not getting sleep for several nights in a row, there is REM rebound. So, you know, this is telling us that REM sleep is actually really key for our mental and physical well-being. And then there's some beginning research about hormone fluctuations and that women tend to have more pleasant dreams right prior to their periods. So uh, maybe check that out, women who are still on their cycle. I also want to point out this beautiful artwork because this is one of my dear friends, Monica Vizile, who uh, created this piece of work. And this is the herb mugwort. And mugwort is actually one of several herbs that are thought to help enhance dream recall. I don't have any information about how much do I take. Um, I don't really know that, but um, I do know mugwort and there's also an herb called valerian, which are thought to be really good to help dream recall. And we'll talk a little bit down the road about if you're not remembering your dreams, how do you start to remember your dreams? So when I was just finishing up my graduate studies, I spent um, a year doing a clinical internship at Rush Medical Center in uh, downtown Chicago. And uh, Dr. Rosalind Carter was actually one of my um, core professors or um, supervisors in that year. So I actually spent part of my year working in a sleep disorders clinic. So I got to watch sleep studies. I got to learn how to analyze sleep data. Um, I learned a lot about dreaming from Dr. Carter. And she wrote a well-known um, book. And her real focus was that sleep is like having a good internal psychotherapist. So she writes, good sleep and rest restores our weary bodies and good dreams temper our emotional responses to new experiences. So she was um, a beautiful um, dreamer herself. And um, I learned a lot from that year about sleep. I think maybe that was some of the seeds of my deep interest in this. So there are two scientific theories that I want to talk about that explain, many scientists say, this is explains why we dream. Um, and the first one is the activation synthesis hypothesis. And this is essentially just that um, said in a very easy way that our brain fires at night um, as a way to process through all of the things that happen through the day. And that there aren't actually any meanings to our dreams. It's just random firing that happens during the middle of the night that help us clear out the intensity from our system. So that's one hypothesis. And the second scientific hypothesis is called the threat simulation theory, which is essentially, and this hypothesis came after activation synthesis. These are a couple Harvard professors who came up with this one, but, um, you know, if you have a pet and you ever watch your dog, do you notice that your dog dreams like my dog, you know, you can hear him whining, you can hear him like barking internally, um, he's clearly chasing a squirrel or something. So um, even animals seem to have REM sleep and dream situ dreams. And so this theory says, well, we must dream as a way to help us work out and practice if we're threatened. So in the middle of the night in our dream, the amygdala is part of the brain. It's your fight flight part of the brain that gets stimulated. And maybe we're dreaming at night to help prime us or help us practice what we might do if we face a threat. So that's another theory as to why we dream. So, so that, that's what the pure science says. So this is what I think, and this is what I've been taught. And from all of my different studies over the years, this is why I think we dream. Dreams help us solve problems. They are a deep source of guidance for us. They also can really open us up to creativity, new potentials, um, all of those um, different uh, inventions that I just showed you, right? Those are creative ideas. 
that came to um, these brilliant thinkers during their dream life. Um, I also believe that dreams can help us recover aspects of ourself that we've lost along the way. So this is the idea that over the course of a lifetime, over the course of stress and trauma and challenge, there are aspects of us that get splintered away. You know, they that there are parts of us that we lose. Um, you know, some people would say it's aspects of our soul that we lose throughout the course of a life. And dreaming allows us to recover or reclaim those lost aspects of self. And then last but not least, dreams can show us what we really want. They actually can show us. So our rational left brain can say, no, 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 you you, sh you want this. And then your dream life shows up something completely different. And so dreams often show us what our soul is really longing for. I love this quote by Jung, the conscious mind, which is that left linear brain, allows itself to be trained like a parrot, but the unconscious does not, which is why St. Augustine thanked God for not making him responsible for his dreams. So I have no idea what was uh, St. Augustine was dreaming about, but clearly he was a little embarrassed by it. And so he could sort of um, say, well, those, those aren't really mine. Those dreams aren't really mine. Well, of course, those dreams are yours and they are a clue to your subconscious mind, the part of your mind that you might not have uh, regular access to. So Carl Jung um writes, in fact, I want to show you this before I talk about murder. I'm going to keep you on the edge of your seats here before we talk about murder. There's this beautiful book. It's called The Red Book. I have mine here. It weighs, it literally weighs about 50 pounds. It's almost as big as me. Um, the Red Book by Carl Jung. And it's essentially his dreams. And ooh, look at what I opened to. He did lots of beautiful drawings and writings. It's all in German. He was Austrian. Uh, but of course, in the back, there is um, a translation of it. Ooh, look at, I keep opening to good pages. There's another gorgeous drawing from his dream life. So this, um, this is a coffee table book, but it's one that I actually go back and look at quite often. And Jung was... Um, he was one of the key people to really say, we got to look and understand dreams. And in this red book, which is a sort of a many of his dreams that he would write out, he would draw, um, he would try to understand. And one of his dreams was um, about him murdering the hero. Um, and in the section where he talks about this dream, he writes, we also live in our dreams. We do not live only by day. Sometimes we accomplish our greatest deeds in dreams. So sometimes we accomplish our greatest deeds in dreams. So really beginning to think about your dream life is as real and perhaps as important in your life as your waking life is. Now, to those of you who don't dream or don't remember your dreams or haven't worked with dreams, this might be sort of a hard concept to fully embrace. But I can say after being right in depth with my own dreams for the last decade, my dream life can be as powerful and things, uh, very profound things can happen in my dream life that seem as important as what's happening in my day-to-day -day life. I do not wake up every morning with a dream. I'm lucky if I get one dream a week that I remember. Uh, certain periods of my life, I will remember more dreams. Uh, but when I get that dream, I know there's some key information in, for, in there for me to call. So just like Young dreamed about murder, I had a whole period in my dream life where I was being hounded by murder. Um, I want to share just little bits and pieces of some of my dreams over the years, not to bore you, but to also just elucidate to help you sort of open up to um, our dreams. Because so often what the dream looks like on the surface, I've learned over the years, is not at all its meaning. Dreams are deeply symbolic. So if we 
take the dream literal, we usually miss the point. So in this dreams, I was having a series of dreams. And this was during the time that I was working with Kathy Pagano. And I was having um, dream after dream about a murderer. I knew the murderer was male. And the murderer would show up in public places where I would be. Interestingly enough, the murderer never went after me. So the murderer didn't try to kill me, but the murderer was killing other women around me. Now, what I started to make sense of over this dream series was that the murderer was going after Barbie doll type figures in my dreams. He was going after um, you know, these beautiful, well coiffed, um, sort of plastic women that were in the same situation that I was in this dream. Well, at the beginning of this dream series, I was quite terrified, right? Just like if you've ever had a dream where someone's trying to kill you or chasing after you, it's terrifying. So again, on the surface, these dreams look horrible. They look bad. Why? You know, there's a murderer showing up. What does this mean? And what, through the help of my uh, dream analyst, we began to understand that this murderer was helping me. This murderer, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, every character in a dream is actually you. And this murderer was a part of me that was finally killing off the aspects of me that were like a Barbie doll it was killing off the plastic, inauthentic, need to look a certain way, parts of me that were no longer working in my life. Um, the aspects of um, maybe what I learned growing up or believed what I should look like or how I should act. This murderer was coming through and saying, nope, and now this one will be killed. And now this aspect of you will be killed. And so what, again, looked like on the surface is very scary. Oh my gosh, there's a murderer killing women. Um, it was a beneficial, it was showing me that I was beginning to release and kill off parts of myself that were no longer relevant to me. All right, let's keep going. That was my murder. That's my murderer dream series. All right, so this is the core question I get asked by people. Um, I do a lot of dream work with clients. I lead a lot of groups and we tend to, you know, get excited about talking about dreams. How the heck do I remember my dreams? This is a big one. Um, I will say that when I started uh, a regular meditation practice, which is a, around the same time as my midlife crisis slash awakening, and around the time that I started to do dream work. So I was, I was doing lots of things during that period of my life to make sense of what was going on. And um, I came across some data just recently um, that people who tend to experience more alpha brain waves in their frontal lobes have better dream recall. And meditators are regularly shown to have more alpha brain waves. So this link is really clearly showed up in my life that I, I realized that when I started to do regular meditation, I was really starting to be able to recall my dreams in a much more consistent way. Before, you know, I would have a big dream here or there. And I would often write it down, but I wasn't having sort of a regular relationship to my dreams in the same way I do now. But meditation can, I think, definitely enhance dream recall. The other thing is not using an alarm. This can be a hard one, right? Especially for us that, you know, have to get up early and get kids off to activities or school. Um, but when you use an alarm, your body can wake up anywhere in that sleep cycle. And if you wake up during stage two or three, you're not dreaming. So you're not going to remember anything. Um, usually we cycle through stage one, two, three, four. Then we go into REM. And it's usually at the end of a REM cycle that we awaken naturally. So if you get up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, that's usually at the end of a REM cycle. And so it's also common that 
in your trudge to the bathroom, sometimes you might have some dream recall that's happening because you've just finished a REM cycle, potentially, not always. Um, so if you, uh, you know, maybe weekends, you choose not to set an alarm and uh, you allow your you allow your body to naturally awaken. And then when you wake up, really key to try not to move. This is, again, it takes some training. So I'm sharing all this with you now. I had to train myself in all of these concepts as well. When you wake up, um, as soon as you wake up, what I do now is I try, I stay very still. And I try to recapture even little just nuggets of the dream I was just in. It doesn't always work, but if I can get one little nugget, then usually I can begin to recreate what was just happening. Now, I do find if I wake up and I turn over or I change positions, boom, often the dream then disappears. So you try to wake up naturally, you try to stay still, and right away it's like, instead of like, okay, I gotta get out of bed, I gotta get going, I've got this to do, the dreams will be gone. You have to sort of lay there, even allowing yourself to maybe drift in and out a little bit, um, seeing if you can hold on to where you just were in the dream. So those are sort of the things I do in the morning. Now, the, the thing I do right before I fall asleep, and I do this religiously every single night, I lay in my bed, I usually have one hand on my heart and one hand on my navel. And I literally will say out loud or sometimes internally, I want to remember my dreams. I'm also at the point in my own dream life work that I will specifically ask for a type of dream or I will say, I could use some guidance on this. Will you please bring me a dream? So I'm actively asking um, to have dreams and people that are like, I never remember my dreams. I want to, I will often say, just state out loud every night. I want to remember my dreams or I, I will remember my dreams. I will remember my dreams. So that can sometimes prompt um, some recall the next morning. And then you have to write your impressions down immediately or they, they do leave. In fact, I can be laying there in bed and feel like I've, I just got such a strong grasp of the dream. And then I get up and I go to the bathroom and it's gone and I cannot get it back. And so I used to keep um, a pad of paper or a journal next to my bed. And instead what I do now is I use my phone. I use the note sections of my phone and I, talk, I speak it or I might use the voice text and I speak it into my phone. So I have literally hundreds of dreams saved in my phone now. And I, I like that because I can keep my eyes closed as I recite the dream, which keeps me in that space, which allows me to remember more of the details. So these are some, um, I also know I, I've learned that there are some uh, devices out there um, to awaken you after a REM cycle, um, you know, some other devices that I, that was the one that I read about to kind of help with dream recall, but maybe try some of these non-invasive things first and see how they work. So I'm curious from all of you, how often you remember your dreams? Um, this was from a poll done in 2021. And by the way, I did read that, um, during COVID, people were dreaming more. That was kind of, um, someone did some research on that. And they think it's because people were sleeping longer. They were lounging in bed longer. They weren't rushing out the door. Um, and that there was a lot of stress. There was a lot of unknown going. And so people's minds were really trying to make sense of it. So this one was done in 2021. How often do you remember your dreams? So, you know, only about 30, 34% rarely or never remembers the dream. About 70% of us have some dream recall. I mean, it's very universal. Dreams are very universal. And even people who say, I rarely remember my dreams, um, almost everyone has had sort of an epic dream that they remember. Maybe it's a childhood dream. Maybe it's a repetitive dream that keeps coming back over and over. But most of us do have some dream images that we can remember from some point in our life. And so again, this is this is powerful, I believe, very powerful information from your wise mind, from something in the, the mysterious great beyond that has some guidance and information for you. So there's many types of dreams. 
here's several of them. Um, we all daydream, by the way. And, you know, some would say daydreams are as powerful as night dreams. And so um, being conscious of where does your mind tend to go? What, what do you dream about? Um, as I mentioned before, many of us have an epic dream. Like we have a really clear dream that came to us that we will never forget. It awoke us. It was real. We felt like we were really there in it. Um, sometimes these will be considered ar archetypal dreams, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, we can have false awakening dreams. These are those dreams where you um, feel like you're actually awake, but you're not. So I've had many dreams where I feel like I'm going to the bathroom, I'm on the toilet, and then I wake up and I'm like, wait, <laughs> I'm not on the toilet, I'm in bed. So those are very common. Lucid dreams are talked about a lot. In fact, they're they're kind of like the sexy brand of dreams. People all want to learn how to lucid dream. They're pretty rare. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there about training yourself to lucid dream. I've only had maybe one or two lucid dreams in my life that I can remember. But a lucid dream is where you are in the dream and you know you're dreaming. So you're essentially awake in your own dream and you then have the power to direct what happens to change or shift or make decisions in the dream about how you would like it to go. Um, I think it's it seems, I, at least what I've read about lucid dreaming, is that it's often easiest to get into from more of a nap state than uh, middle of the night. But um, if, you, if there's any of you out there that are regular lucid dreamers, it's a beautiful thing. And if you have the capacity to do it, I've I've read that it's um, it has a real deep impact on helping you sort of uh, create a life that you want, make decisions that uh, really work for you. Of course, we've all had nightmares and night terrors. Night terror terrors are slightly different than nightmares in that it's when you uh, might actually act it out. Usually, in REM sleep, you are uh, your body's paralyzed. Um, night terrors often can be related to sleepwalking. So when I worked in the sleep disorder center, we, we did see a fair amount of children that were having um, sleepwalking night terrors. Um, my oldest son had night terrors for several years. In fact, the other night we were talking about it and he said, I can still see images, but I don't have words for it. He would seem to be awake and terrified, but now I know he was he was in this night terror state. Um, so again, this is, it's not, it's not um, super common, but it does happen. We can have progressive dreams. Those were my murder dreams where the, they sort of build on each other. It's sort of like they're a series. We can have precognitive dreams or prophetic dreams, meaning we um, dream about the future. And I actually get a lot of precognitive dreams. I'm going to talk about one in a moment. And then, of course, we have recurring dreams. So the brave soul who sent me her dream who said, Betsy, I'd like to know what this is about. Um, the dream I'm going to share of hers at the end today is a recurring dream. So it's a dream that she said she's had multiple times. So I, uh, like I said, I get a lot of precognitive dreams. And these are my uh, best friends from college. We went to college together in Minnesota. And um, I saw these women, I see them about once a year, and I saw these um, fun women last fall or last, no, last spring, it would have been last spring. So I bring that up and that that was the last time I saw them. So that was maybe August. In January, I, right after Christmas, I actually dreamed for about 10 nights straight. That's a rare thing for me. As I said, I usually only dream if I'm lucky, I remember about one dream a week, but I, after Christmas, I was having a new dream that I remembered every single morning. And I learned from my dream teacher, Kathy Pagano, that often um, at that cusp between Christmas and the new year, there's like the 12 days of Christmas. And those 12 days, the dream that you wake up with uh, will represent each month of the year. So if you wake up on the morning of the 26th of December or yeah, the 26th of December, that dream represents what's going to happen in January. 
the 27th, that dream represents what's going to happen in February, all of this. So because I was dreaming every single night, it reminded me of that. It's like, well, maybe these are my 12 days of Christmas dreams that are showing me what's going to happen throughout the course of 2024. So I wrote them all down. I actually, in my journal, put a page for each month. All right. Well, these hoo-hahs, these, these beautiful women showed up in dream number three, my third dream that, you know, in that consecutive order. And in this dream, we were all together at some party, but uh, Allie, my one friend, she was very busy with her husband and she was trying to get him involved. And then two of my other friends were sort of floating around the surface of the dream. And then my friend Holly she was the one that she and I were sort of arguing with each other in this dream and we're sort of slapping each other on the face in this dream. So I was like, I have no idea what this means. So this was December. Uh, come Feb So this dream that I had in December was supposed to represent my month of March, according to this dream theory. I hope you guys are following. This isn't too confusing. So come February, an invitation came in the mail from my friend Allie, who was having a 50th surprise birthday party for her husband, Justin. I laughed. I was like, of course, that's my, the, the party was on March 1. My dream for March was with these literally five women. And so um, I decided last minute that I was going to go to this party. So I'd drive up to this party. The funny thing is the dream, Allie, in my dream, Allie was involved with her husband. That, this was the party that was going on. Two of my friends were sort of floating around the surface in the dream and neither of them were at the party. Holly, the one that I was talking to and slapping, she was the one who was at the party and we were together all night, I actually stayed with her and we went back and forth all night long. And we, we didn't slap each other on the face, but it shows me how, how do I make sense of that? This dream that I had in December actually predicted this event that came in March. So this is what I mean by precognitive dreams. It's, a, it's actually can be quite common that we are collecting information that may come true down the road. So it is at times hard to know, is this a precognitive dream or not? But, you know, at least for me, they're actually quite common. So these are some of the common dream themes. Y'all know them, being chased, failing exams, showing up naked to class, flying, teeth falling out. Does anyone have teeth falling out? That's a common one for me. Visits from deceased loved ones. I want to speak to this for a moment. There's an amazing writer who has written many books about dreams. I think I own all of them. And the author is Robert Moss. Robert Moss actually has a theory that when we dream of a loved one who is deceased, that it actually is the loved one. It's not just a dream about the loved one. Um, and in his book, the dream, the dreamers book for something about the dead and dreaming, Robert Moss, Sean, you can probably find it. Um, he'll put it in the chat box if he finds it. Um, but, and I've talked to so many people that have lost a loved one and their loved one has shown up in a dream. Robert Moss would say, that's actually their soul. That's their spirit. They're coming to let you know they're okay. They're coming to show you something. They're coming to help you with something. They just want to reach out and let you know. So he, Robert Moss says, our dead loved ones can actually make contact with us through the dream state. They can't make it necessarily with us through a waking state, but they can come into our dream state and connect to us. So if any of you have had dreams about loved ones who've passed, um, again, Robert Moss would say that was really their soul, their spirit reaching out to you. So how the heck do we interpret our dreams? I would say this is not a science. It's definitely an art. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in it in the same way that Kathy Pagano or even Dr. Maurer are, um, but I certainly have gotten more adept at it over the years of looking at my own dreams and working with people. 
So there's a couple different ways you can go about looking at your dreams. The, the first method is the method that I'm most familiar with, which is everything in a dream is you. So if you have multiple characters in a dream, let's say your uncle shows up in a dream, that is actually an aspect of you in the dream. If your husband is in the dream, that's an aspect of you. So often when I'm doing dream work with someone, I'll say, they say, well, my friend Rachel showed up in this dream. And I'll say, well, give me three descriptors of Rachel. I only want three. And they're like, well, she's funny and she's sociable and um, she's sort of the life of the party. So then Rachel in the dream, I'll say, well, this is the part of you that's actually funny and sociable, wants to be the life of the party. So beginning to look at your dreams as just everything in it is an aspect of you. So to go back to my dream with the murderer, the murderer in my dream was an aspect of me. It was the wise part of me that is saying, hey, these old ways, these old parts of you, these old aspects of you, they're not working anymore in your current life. They're not authentic to you. We got to get rid of them. We got to slash and burn and kill them off, right? So the murderer in my dream was actually me. So everything in a dream is you. Another way to interpret it, and this is really the work of Robert Moss, who I just mentioned, is that when we when we go in our dreams to past times in our life, so let's say you dream about high school a lot, or let's say you go back to your childhood and there's lots of dreams from your childhood. You literally are recovering aspects of yourself that you lost at that period in your life, right? And so this is, this is coming more from a soul perspective, but our soul, we can lose vital energy. We can use, lose parts of our younger selves. We can lose sort of this animal spirit energy in us. We can lose ancestral soul we can lose connection with our wise greater self and so dreams can be seen as when you go back and you recover or reclaim or take back the energy that you lost at various stages in your life this is a new way for me to think about dreams but i have to say it's really helpful there are there is a period in my life that i go back to often in dreams i'm like why am i back here again and I really feel like it is in my dream life. I'm going back to keep taking back parts of myself that got frozen or got lost or got confused at that point in my life. And then last but not least, this is this is really, I think, such a cornerstone of dream interpretation. Everything is symbolic. So as I said before, your dreams are not what they look like on the surface, right? You meet Uncle Harold for soup at the kitchen of your childhood. That is not, I mean, we got to dig in and really symbolically pull apart all these different parts of the dream to make sense. And why is this dream showing up for you now? Because there's something that you are ready to learn, see, integrate, know in your current day. And the thing about dreams is dreams are persistent, so I can look back now and see how I was having similarly themed dreams for a long time because I wasn't getting it in my own life. But the dreams just kept coming and they just changed a little bit. It was a new scene. It was a new drama. But the theme was there. I was trying to catch my attention. And until I learned that lesson and was able to integrate it in my own life, um, I kept having the dreams. All right, so it's really key if you want to work with dream interpretation that you have to start to learn symbolism. It's very interesting if you do any kind of study of sort of um, ancient mystery schools, this is a big part of what um, people used to learn is they used to learn all about symbols. And symbols are thought to be the bridge between our conscious and our unconscious mind. And, you know, anytime we're working with dreams, we're working with material from our unconscious mind. So as it comes up to the surface in our dreams, so like here, hey, look at this, Betsy. It's not, it doesn't come up in, you know, it's sort of like a different language. It speaks in symbols. It doesn't speak in modern day English in the way that I, you know, my, my literal mind wants to analyze it. So we have to start to get a real grasp of symbolism. And um, there are three sort of categories of symbols. One is conventional. And so 
there's lots of ways I figure out what's, what is this symbol? What would this be symbolic of? I do a lot of Googling. What is the symbolism of a turtle? What is the symbolism of a, um, a boat? What is the symbolism of water? And you're going to get a whole lot of answers. And with, with dream interpretation, you really have to feel into, oh, this feels right. Or this seems, there's an energy behind this. Or my body lit up when I learned this, this um, interpretation of this symbol. I also have this book. It's one of those books that you find on the sale table at Barnes and Noble. You can still see the sales sticker on it. Signs and Symbols, source book, right? And it's been really helpful at helping me make sense of the symbolism of my dreams and what maybe it is trying to tell me. All right. We can also have personal symbols. So this is where really dream interpretation does get super personal because in a dream, um, a hummingbird may show up, which is a quick moving, never stops, you know, symbolism of, okay, I'm moving quick, I'm moving quick, it doesn't stop. But for other people, a hummingbird may be a symbol of their dead mother. And so really, you know, not getting so hemmed in on, well, the book, the dream book says that this is symbolic of X, Y, or Z. Okay, yeah, maybe it is, but does that does that work for you? Do you have other meanings for a brick wall? Do you have other meanings for a fire, fire hydrant? Do you have memories around daffodils, right? So you're not only looking at the conventional meaning, but like how, what is this symbol? What is this object to this person? What do they mean to me? And then last but not least, there's a lot of archetypal symbols. And I'm not going to get into this too deep because this could be another whole hour, but you can take a look at, um, you know, when homes show up in, an, in a dream, it's often a representation of ourself, right? So these are some archetypal meanings. Archetypes are patterns of energy that we all contain in our collective unconscious so these are, again, just a really brief examples of archetypal symbols. Okay, so I'm looking here what else I've left. Um, I'm going to save, I, ha I had a dream about a lot of phosphorescent animals, but I'll get to that. I want to make sure we get to other people's dreams here. The other big piece about dream interpretation is always what emotion is going on in the dream. What are you feeling in the dream? What's happening? How does it, how does it feel? Because you might be getting murdered in your dream, but you feel curious or you feel joyful, right? So emotion really is a key piece to understand. And then the last thing I want to say is um, there's a whole history of dream sharing, right? Where in ancient civilizations, you would get together in groups and there would be dream shamans there and it would be sort of um, the responsibility of the community to help the person understand their dream, to make sense of it, because um, ancient people saw dreams as, again, guidance. What, what do we need to know and understand? So I'm a big believer in dream sharing, which is why I share dreams with someone every week. Also, why in many of the courses I teach, we do dream groups or we do a dream call to help people make sense of what's going on in their dream life. And then this is my last slide before we go into the brave dream that someone sent me. Okay, so let's say you do remember a dream, then what do you do with it? Well, of course, write it out. Start to research some of the symbols in the dream. Think about what was happening around the time that you had the dream. So if you wake up on a Tuesday morning, what was happening on Monday? that might have prompted this dream, might have brought some of this symbolism up. I think talking it out, speaking dreams out loud is so key because as you speak it, sometimes you start to remember more information from the dream and you start to, um, there's certain turns of phrases that come up that may be meaningful. And draw your dreams. So I, similar to Jung who had a, big uh, red book. I created, I wanted to find a red, big red book, but I found a black book instead. 
And um, I'm not an artist at all, but I started to draw some of my dreams. Um, there's my phosphorescent animals, right? And there's something about drawing out dreams that can be very powerful. It's another way to process the dream. A couple more ideas for you. You can act them out, move them out. And then the last thing I want to say when a client has a dream or a friend has a dream and there's still parts of it they don't understand, one of the te techniques I learned is to go back into the dream in your waking life. So I literally will close my eyes. I'll go into somewhat of a meditative state. I may play some drumming in the back, so uh, drumming track. And I just recreate in my mind the dream. And then using visualization, I change the ending or I see what else is going to play out. Now, people would say, well, you're making that up, Betsy. <laughs> That's true. I am. But you, it's often amazing your mind where it will take you. What additional information will come by you just simply going back into the dream and replaying it. All right, that was a lot. You can tell I love this topic. It's so exciting to me. But I want to take a moment to go through this dream that someone sent me. And I just want to make sure that I'm not missing any questions here. Okay, great. There's a couple of dreams that people are sharing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will, um, a lot of people are asking about books. I'll give a couple um, dreams or a couple uh, ideas about books. I'll put them in the show notes. That'll be on YouTube. Okay, so I see one dream here from someone. And then someone sent me a dream earlier. So I want to start with the dream. And we may go over a little over time here today. So those of you who can stay on, please do. I could talk about dreams all day. Um, but I want to get through the one that someone sent me and then the person who bravely put it in the chat box, I will get to that dream as well. All right. So this is a dream submitted by, um, a woman in her fifties. She writes, I'm forced to move to a different house in a neighborhood. I do not know. And I have to live with my former husband. We are both in the situation without our choosing and we are divorced. Most of the time, the house has structural issues, is dark, and in a totally unfamiliar location. We are both unhappy. And when I awaken, I often feel disoriented and also upset that I keep having this dream and that I'm dragging my former husband into the dream. It's as if my current life doesn't matter and we're forced back together in a place neither of us wants to be. All right, so... You can tell, first of all, the emotion here is frustration, disorientation, upset, not happy. The person that sent this dream to me also said, this is a repetitive dream. So when you have a repetitive dream, I always think it has some extra power. It's almost like, again, whatever message is coming through to you, you're not fully receiving it, understanding it, integrating it into your life. So you just keep getting the dream over and over. So if we take the theory that everything in a dream is you, that's sort of the stance I'm going to take with this dream. And houses in dream often represent us. Um, houses also in a dream can sometimes be representative of the body. Um, the idea is that our soul is housed in our body. So our bodies in this lifetime are the landing spot, the home um, for our soul to engage in the world. So in this dream, you're forced to move to a different house, right? So you are maybe forced to be in a different body. I don't know if you had some body changes going on at the time of this dream. Um, there's something different in you that's changing. And you're in a neighborhood you do not know. So we think about a neighborhood, what is a neighborhood? It's a collective. It's lots of different people all living in the same vicinity. So in this dream, it's representing, I'm in this new space and there's lots of players here that I don't know 
It's unfamiliar, right? Um, I think you even use the word doesn't feel completely safe, right? So there's a time in your life where it's like, I'm in this new situation. I'm maybe in this new body, something's going on and it, it it's not normal. It doesn't feel safe. You're also living with your former husband. So again, on the surface, we could say, oh, your ex is in the dream. But if we think about dream interpretation as everything is you, there's a masculine part of you. It's a former part of you. It's a part of you that you've already split from and you're being forced to live with it again. So uh, what is a masculine part of us? Well, masculine part is for all of us, our inner masculine is the part of us that takes action. It does things, it, it penetrates, it gets things done, it makes things happen. So in this dream, there's an old part of you, an old action doing part of you that is back. And you're not exactly happy to be back with this old masculine part of you because you split from this part before, right? And now you're back together with this part, this old part of you that you thought you were maybe done with. And so this old part of you, this old masculine part of you that you thought you were done with, you're living in this different body, this different house, this different part of self. And there's structural issues. It's dark. Can't see things clearly. It's unfamiliar, right? And it's not happy. So if this dream were mine, I, I would really be thinking about, again, what are old masculine aspects of me that I've picked back up. I've reunited and reconnected and it's not making me happy. And it's unfamiliar. And it's structurally not safe for me to reconnect with this old masculine. Now, another way you could think about it is um, this old masculine part of you. What are qualities of your ex that are also in you that you are seeing show up in your life again. This is one way to look at a dream. Now, I have to say there are literally thousands of ways for you to interpret dreams. So whenever I do dream interpretation with people, my first question always is, what do you think it means? So I ask them first, what do you think it means? Because I want them to really make sense of it. And then of course it can help to have someone else's perspective, but I've worked with people and the sort of perspective I give them, they're like, oh my gosh, that's it. Yes, that makes so, so much sense. Yes, this was happening. And yes, my body went through this and like everything clicks together for them. And then other people be like, mm, I don't know, mm, maybe, I guess it could be that way, but I'm not sure. You only allow in what you're like, yes right? Yes. I think when we get a dream interpretation that resonates with our soul, we do our body sort of lights up. We feel like that's it. That's it. That makes sense. Yes. You're on to something. So watch, you know, you know who you are, who had this dream. Does it speak to you? Is there any aspects of what I told you that clicked into place that you're like, yes, if not, throw it out. Okay. That was a very quick quick little foray into it. Okay, let me see if there's any. Um, great question. What do we do with the information once we understand it? Then you got to integrate it. Life is all about integration. We can go to years of therapy. We can analyze our dreams. We can understand all of it. And unless we act on it and start to change how we live, change our behaviors, change what we're doing in our life, it's it's sort of meaningless. So like why go to all the work to understand yourself if you're just going to stay stuck in the same situation? It's a great question. Okay, let's go into someone else sent me a dream that I want to go through that I've not ever looked at. So this is really good because sometimes I get some really quick things right away. Okay, this person um, sent it just to me, so I'm not gonna say their name. Um, it's a woman, I will say that much. I've had several dreams about floods since 2008. 
Early this morning, I had a flood dream. I was in a large house with several people, all of us sleeping on the floor. We were somewhere like a mountain. It had been raining quite a bit and all of us were worried. Several decided to drive away, as in down, maybe drive down the mountain, I'm thinking. I was in a car, possibly driving. We drove down and down and suddenly came to a wide expanse of water. The idea was to go forward, but got really stuck in mud skidding. Where was the road? It was beautiful seeing this huge expanse of water, but also scary. We could see a car in the water driving toward us, but, to car, but no cars going in our direction. Where were our friends? Water seemed to be rising, so we turned around in the mud, attempting to go back up the mountain. It was hard to turn around, but we did. Beginning to go back, I was wondering how we would all eat, drink. Possibly we would stop for food, water, supplies. I woke up wondering where we would get supplies. All right, so this dream is really cool because it just happened. So if I were having a conversation with this person, I would really want to know what was going on yesterday or what's been going on in the last couple of days that led to this dream coming forward for you. So water in any dream, whether it's ocean water, river water, flood water, um, water tends to archetypally represent emotion. So here there's a flood of emotion. There's a flood of feeling. So again, I'd be curious to know what's been going on in the last couple of days for you. So is there been a flood of emotion? Has there been a lot of new feelings that have come forward for you? You're in a large house with several people. So you're in a large sense, you have a large sense of self. If your house is you, if your house is your body, right? With several people and all of you are sleeping on the floor. So you're close to the earth, right? All these different parts of you sleeping in this house, you're close to the earth. You're connected to earth energy. And what is earth energy? Earth energy is stable, secure, steadfast, right? It's very steady. And you're on a mountain, right? Which is also really steadfast and unchanging. So there's a part of you, if everything in a dream is you, there's a part of you that's very steadfast. And you're up on this steadfast part. So there's lots of rain coming. And the rain is creating a little bit of worry. So potentially lots of emotion, lots of feeling coming. It's creating a little bit of worry. But you decide to drive away. You're trying to drive away from whatever is brewing, whatever this sort of internal emotional storm is, you're trying to drive away from it. Now, um, in the car, you're possibly driving. Whenever someone is in a car, I always want to know, are you in the driver's seat? This is really key because sometimes we're in a car going somewhere and we're on a journey, but we're not in charge. There's someone else in the driver's seat. So if in a dream you're in the driver's seat, it's often a good um, sort of symbol that, yeah, I got this. I'm in charge of this. And it sounds like in this dream, you were the one that you think was in the driver's seat. You come down, 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 down. So in a mountain, a mountain also represents like sort of the top of the mountain is high spiritual expansion. You come down, down, down the mountain. As we descend, we're going deeper down towards the earth, towards the water, towards the emotion. You can also think from an energetics perspective as we go down, 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 down. We're getting deeper into our psyche. We're getting deeper into our subconscious. We're going below the surface, right? So you're coming down closer and it's wide. It's a huge expanse of water. It's also beautiful. So you can think about whatever big, deep, emotional depth is there. It's also beautiful. Yes, it's a little bit scary. You're wondering, am I going to get stuck in all of this? And it's beautiful. You're not sure if you can get across it, though. And so you decide to go up. You go back up the mountain. So going up the mountain to me also feels like I'm going to go back up into my head. As you go down, 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 down towards the water, I mean, where do we feel where emotions often live deep down in our pelvis, right? They live down in the depths of our womb space. So you're going down, 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 down towards the dark, towards the unknown, towards the emotion. And it feels a little scary. It doesn't feel safe. So you're like, I'm going to go back up in my head. I'm going to go back up to the top of the mountain. No judgment, right? This is just in the dream. Maybe this is what you need right now. Maybe going back up into your head, going back 
away from the depths of the emotion is actually what you need right now. And the dream is saying, it's okay. You can find su supplies. All right. So whose ever dream that was, reach out to me. Let me know if there's anything in there that spoke to you. I hope so. That was very quick. Just, I like to give people little nuggets and then have you chew on them and then take it forward yourself with drawing, with writing, with going through it in your mind as well. Okay. Let me see if there's anything else. I'm going to See if there's anything else collaging someone said is also great to do with dreams. Yes. Thank you, Sharon. I love that idea. Beautiful. Nancy had a dream where she got the exact date that she would retire. She was trying to figure that out and she went with it. That is so beautiful. And that's where dreams really can give us very practical advice. And Nancy did something really important as well. She followed through on it. So we can get all this amazing information from our dreams. And if we don't act on it, we lose it. So I, I love that you followed up. That also means your dreams are going to keep coming to you because it's like your dream, you're showing your dreams. I trust you. Look at I'm following up in my life based on what you've told me. Okay. I got through all the questions. I hope that's helpful. Maybe we'll do a part two Wisdom Wednesday down the road. Um, and just stay tuned. When I do programs, I often do uh, dream salons or dream hours where we come together and we do dream sharing. And it's, it's really powerful. You often uh, hear someone else's dream and you're like, oh, I sense something in that dream about that I relate to as well. So it's powerful stuff. Keep dreaming. Keep writing them down. Keep um, just working them. Work those dreams. There's a lot in there for them. Thank you, everyone. This was a joyful hour for me. I love nothing more than to understand dreams. And um, we will see you again in August for our next Wisdom Wednesday. Uh, in the meantime, you can go watch old ones. There's lots of them. We'll make sure we have them posted um, in the show notes for this episode. Thanks, everyone. Ah, and whoever's dream I just talked about, thank you for letting me know that you got something from that. And yes, please write me um, as well. Okay, much love to all of you.